All right. Well, good afternoon. It is fantastic to be here on a beautiful day in the city of Gloucester by the Haskell Reservoir. And I have to say, lately, um, even when it's a cloudy, rainy, overcast morning when we show up for these grant funding announcements uh, related to climate change, related to resiliency, related to community infrastructure, and the governor and the lieutenant governor are here, we tend to get the sunshine. Um, so <laughs> we are, we're here today to talk about our, our dam and seawall program, and the governor is going to make an announcement uh, related to that. But I think what we're really talking about on a larger scale is critical infrastructure that underpins uh, the fabric of our communities, that keeps residents safe, that keeps clean water and natural resources healthy, and that ensures businesses and, and residents can continue on and build really strong communities. And we're looking to do a whole lot more of that. We've seen the impacts of climate change. We've seen these really intense storms coming. And the governor and the lieutenant governor have a plan that would invest nearly a billion dollars of federal recovery funds into this game-changing, once-in-a-generation opportunity to improve our environment, improve public health, and invest in our communities. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our governor, who knows more about culverts and dams than many people in the Commonwealth. So thank you very much, Madam Secretary, and it's Mayor, Representative, Senator, it's great to be here in Gloucester again and to be making this announcement. As the Secretary said, it's such a critical time for cities and towns across the Commonwealth during what has been an especially challenging summer with respect to extreme weather. Just in the past two months, our state's experienced two significant heat waves and a record amount of rainfall, creating significant challenges for our communities and aging infrastructure across Massachusetts that's struggling to keep up with the precipitation which is leading to flooding and damage to roads in many communities as well as to other assets. I have to say that, you know, three or four years ago was the first time we proposed legislation to create a fund, a revolving fund, that would put $130 million a year annually into a program that was designed to deal with the very old and inadequate environmental infrastructure that we have here in Massachusetts. We say here in Massachusetts that climate change is real. We say we believe we cannot wait to do something about it. We say this over and over and over again, and for three years, we've been filing legislation to create a revolving fund to make the investments that we need to make in our environmental infrastructure to deal with severe storms, inadequate infrastructure, and the constantly changing nature of weather. And that is why we also proposed, as the Secretary said, to spend a billion dollars on environmental infrastructure, on clean water, and on many of the other elements of our state that deserve, require these kinds of investments if we're to be serious about battling not just the long-term effects of climate change, but the stuff that's going on right now and will continue to go on this year, next year, the year after, and the year after that. And that's a big part of what this is about today. We're here today to announce $17 million in grant funding to support 32 critical dam and seawall projects in 28 communities across Massachusetts. And we're making this announcement here in Gloucester because the city is on the front lines in the effort to adapt to the impacts of climate change. In this particular round, the city of Gloucester is receiving two grants through the Dam and Seawall Program to support two important projects, a $2.3 million grant to support the construction of a flood barrier to protect Gloucester High School, and a $1 million grant to support the design and reconstruction of the core wall of the Haskell Dam, which is what's here, which you can see behind us. The importance of this project to the City of Gloucester cannot be overstated. It's a critical element of the drinking water supply for the City of Gloucester. The reservoir combined with the dikes nearby accounts for roughly 30% of the drinking water supply for the city. The dam you see here was constructed over 115 years ago. And while the dam has served admirably for over a century, like much of the aging infrastructure across the Commonwealth, 
the construction design at the turn of the last century doesn't meet our modern safety needs. However, the need for the structure itself is as strong as ever. The city and the Commonwealth have invested a lot of money into ensuring the, vi the viability and availability of drinking water to residents and visitors, visitors here. And this is a high hazard dam, which means if it would ever collapse, the consequences for the city would be absolutely devastating, which is why we're working with the city to act now. It's an expensive project, $6 million in all, and will require federal assistance, and it's our hope that this $1 million commitment will put the city in a stronger position to receive federal funding and move the project across the finish line so that it can stand strong and provide another 100 years of service to the people of Gloucester. It's a great example of many other pieces of critical infrastructure that we see all across the Commonwealth that may have been built 75 to 100 years ago or more that are no longer adequate to handle the precipitation and other impacts that we're seeing as a result of climate change. And those impacts, which are already in many cases overwhelming for many communities, will only become more severe in the years ahead. And that's why we proposed, as part of our $2.9 billion ARPA proposal before the legislature, funds that would make it possible for us to put almost a billion dollars to work on critical environmental initiatives, including $300 million to invest in climate resilient infrastructure across the, across the Commonwealth. For a city like Gloucester, these projects don't any, get any more urgent than this one. So we're excited to be here today to provide support for this critical infrastructure and look forward to continuing our discussions with the legislature about the need to take advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity to do something critically important in the fight against climate change, which is to make it possible for our communities to be able to rely on modern infrastructure that's built for the 21st century that will provide all of us with clean water and an opportunity to benefit from these many great natural resources. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and it is beautiful. Thank you, Governor, for delivering the sunshine once again. And thank you. Many of you come from other parts, not just here in the Cape Ann area. So congratulations to the 32 awardees uh, that are receiving grant funds for either design and permitting of your project or construction of your project. I also just want to say thank you to my colleagues in local government. I'll introduce uh, our Mayor of Gloucester in just a minute. But also we have Mayor Nicholson from Gardner who is here and our colleagues in state government, uh, Senator Bruce Tarr and Representative Ann Margaret Ferrante. Uh, this, is a, this, is about, this program is about property and asset protection. When you think about a dam, a seawall, a culvert, most people just assume that this stuff is going to live up to the test of time. And what we have here in Massachusetts is, is like a perfect storm. You have aging infrastructure, old infrastructure. We're an old state in many ways. And here you have a 100-year dam that obviously uh, needs to be updated and will not withstand the test of time. And that's an example of many of these pieces of infrastructure strewn across our Commonwealth. And with today's grant, we have about $17 million reaching 32 uh, communities and projects. But just think of what we could do with the $300 million ARPA, ARPA dollars that could be used to accelerate the pace of the design and permitting and construction of these uh, essential pieces of infrastructure. And the reason I say it's a perfect storm is because if any one of these fails, it will compromise commercial property, it will compromise residential property, and it could compromise an essential resource, like here, a dam of drinking water. And so we can't just say that we're going to just keep doing what we've been doing the last 10, 20, 30 years and think that we're going to provide the people of this commonwealth with resilient infrastructure. It just won't work. The numbers just don't add up. 
we have an inventory of these projects. We've worked through our municipal vulnerability program with nearly every community to map out and plan around what the condition of their infrastructure is in their community. We know what the condition of the infrastructure is. But clearly, municipalities cannot shoulder the burden and the cost of repairing and updating and replacing infrastructure much like this uh, alone. They need to do it in partnership with our state, and that's why programs like this, if, as the governor has said, turbocharged with additional one-time funds from the federal government, we can do a whole lot more to make our communities more resilient to the impacts of climate change. We don't need to look far in time to think about this. We've been living over the course of this month with extreme weather that has impacted uh, dams and culverts uh, all across our Commonwealth creating a lot of pro problems and troubles for municipalities. So we just wanted to come here today to, co of course, congratulate the awardees. You did a lot of work to put your presentation together, and you'll no, uh, no doubt put these dollars to work in your community. But we clearly want to see more of this addressed all throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mayor of Gloucester. She happens to be an integral part of the Seaport Economic Council. She's been a longtime member. She understands infrastructure, both on the coastline and a resource like this that she has in her community. And I want to thank her particularly uh, for her work over the course of this past year and a half as a municipal leader, working hard to keep her residents in her community safe from COVID and really working arm in arm with our administration to deliver the quality services that the people here of Gloucester and the Cape Ann uh, area deserve and need. And with that, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Gloucester's mayor, uh, Taken Romero. Thank you. Well, thank you. The city of Gloucester is thrilled to host today's briefing. Really thrilled. I really, with the bottom of my heart, want to thank the governor, lieutenant governor, Senator Bruce Tarr, Representative Ann Margaret Ferranti, and the city leaders. I could not do this today without our wonderful director of DPW, Mike Hale, the engineering, Ryan Marx, peer group consultants, and Greg Catamatori. We are so thrilled that finally that we're being heard. 100 years old, and it's not the first time that we knew that things have to be repaired and we need to do them. This is an administration that actually, when you say show me the money, has been showing the money. Not only have we been working on the infrastructures and repairing and working with the state, when we went to Senator Tarr's office and they said, well, if we don't fix one thing and you don't do this, you can get penalties and warnings and this and that. And I says, well, we can go back and forth because that's what we did in the past 10 years, you know, back and forth with litigation. What we can save in litigation on our side, your side, we can come up with solutions. And that's what this administration, your administration, Governor, and yours, Lieutenant Governor, is that's what we are. We're doing solutions. We are actually looking at a 130-year-old dam. And um, I must say that, you know what, when we did the dredging and Bruce Tarr made a joke saying, I think I looked out the window when I was born at Addison Gill and said that needs to be dredged. And after how many years later, we get it dredged. And some people don't understand what that meant. And a lot of people don't understand what a lot of the things that we're doing in the water treatment and everything else. But the fact is, this here will affect the whole city of Gloucester. It's 30% of our water supply. And it's just the beginning. As the governor said, it's $6, $6 million. We're already talking to the Congress and federal to come up with more. And we are doing it. I have a great staff that, you know what, and the government comes down and says we can do it this way. And we need to actually, thank you, Secretary, so much. And also um, MVP Coastal Resilience Program because we are doing this. And the best thing about it is, guess what? Yes, the sun is shining because you finally signed the climate bill. And the sun is shining upon you because this is where we're going to get the infrastructure and the money. It's because that's what we're going to be doing. No more. I'm sorry, I have to throw this out. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. But the fact is, he does care, and we all care, because if you look, and you can, whoever wants to, because we all have been taking that tour before, it's amazing. But what's more amazing is the fact that we're working together to repair it, because 
I don't want to be flooded out, and I don't want to be without water. They're saying, well, Mayor, if you're building these housing and all these affordable housings, where are these people going to go? Are we going to have enough water? Are we going to have enough things? You bet, because I have a great DPW director, Michael Hale, who's looking at everything, refurbishing things and things that we can't. Mayor, and way ahead of time that we need this money and we need to do that. This is the first step. And, and with this, it's going to give us even more. So I really want to thank you all again for the stewardship and the leadership that you all have, especially Secretary, I'm sure, with this beautiful island we have. We're going to be seeing a lot of you. And I love working also. I want to throw the Essex here too, my counterparts in my cities because I call it Rockport and uh, Essex Cape Ann because you know what? We're all little hands-on and we all do regionalize and work together. So we're thankful and our sewer. And so you know what? We're looking at that and we're looking at all the programs that we're doing together because we are. We give water to Rockport, we give water and sewer to Essex, and what's happening is that by working together, we're cleaning our act up, we're being proactive, and we're thinking about not for today, but for our future, and that's most important. And we're thinking together, so I really want to, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And the fact is, um, I have a great team out here. Um, if you can give a wave, because I'm, I, Frank Cousins, say hello, Chris, Mike, if you're here, because the fact is, you know what, they're here all the time. And when they're all going like this, I feel hot. They're there when it's really hot, and they're there when it's really cold. And Margaret Bruce, we couldn't do it without you. All the programs we get, no matter how many emails or texts I'll do to the governor, lieutenant governor, they're already in the state house doing the same exact thing. You need to work with your legislative. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or unenrolled like myself. You have to be one. And what we won near one, look what you get to accomplish. We got over $3 million today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And it's such a pleasure to work with your team and, and so many other communities across the state. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two members of our legislative body who both fight so hard for their local communities on this issue. Senator Tarr and I were here back in 2017 looking at all the work that, that needs to be done. And I often think there's, there's not many people who are willing to wonk out on resilient infrastructure uh, and nature-based solutions, but Senator Tarr is one of them. Senator. Well, thank you very much, Madam Secretary, and good afternoon. I, I want to reciprocate by saying thank you for your leadership on so many facets of the climate change and the climate situation that we face. You're an extraordinary leader in these extraordinary times, so thank you so much. It's also great to be here, Governor Baker, with you, and Lieutenant Governor Baker Plito with you, also with my legislative colleague, Representative Ferranti, and our wonderful mayor, Mayor Taken, and also Mayor Nicholson. Welcome. Yes, I'm not sure what time zone you were in when you left to get here, but we are very <laughs> pleased that you're here now. Well, so, so thank you for that. I do also uh, want to recognize. Easterners. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to also recognize um, City Councilor Nolan, um, in whose district we are right now, and thank him for his leadership and his good work. And of course, our friends in Essex, uh, Town Administrator Zubricki and, uh, and Selectman uh, Fippen, thank you so much. You know, today is a remarkable day because it represents the kind of things that we can get done when there is a partnership between the administration and the legislature and our local officials. And the fact is, this program, the, salmon, uh, the uh, dam and seawall program, is something that was initiated by the executive branch, but the legislative delegation also worked on it to make sure that it was a complete 360 degree program that included dams and seawalls. And that partnership is why we're able to be here today. And being here today is really important because across cities and towns all over this state, and particularly on the coast, there are a lot of local officials and others that every night lie awake thinking about how they're going to meet their obligation to maintain some of the most complex and challenging pieces of public infrastructure that exist in our state. And a lot of times they're doing it with very limited municipal budgets where they're trying to fund things like public education and public safety and sanitation and so many other things. And then along comes something like the dam that stands behind us. And you say, how am I going to do that within the constraints of a municipal budget? How am I going to make sure that people have safe drinking water and that there's public safety? Because if that did come down, we'd be in real trouble. And the answer is, we do it with collaboration. And we do it 
with partnership. And that's why the Dam and Seawall program is so important for all of the communities that are getting these grants. And congratulations to Gloucester and Essex and Ipswich and Gardner and so many others because it signals help is on the way. And the partnership is alive. And we have another chance at that partnership right now. We have literally got billions of dollars, the likes of which we have not seen in my time in the legislature. And we have the opportunity to use the kind of partnership that got us here today to deliver partnership for tomorrow. And that's something that I think we should view as a call to action. Today's a victory. It's a victory that this got done. It's a victory that the money's getting out. But it's also a call to action. And the call to action is this. Things are changing around us. The climatological things we can do something about, but they have an impact that we can't change. So we have a choice. Do we say we're going to make the decision to be proactive and we're going to go out and confront the things that people have a really hard time getting their hands around, or are we going to be victims? That's the choice. If we're not proactive, if we don't make good investments, then we'll be here in different circumstances when there's a blizzard or a hurricane or a tornado. And we'll be saying in the 11th hour, what do we do? I guarantee you this. It won't be as cost effective. It won't be as well planned. It won't be as well engineered as it would be if we took action in advance to make sure that the right thing gets done. That means hard decisions. It means a lot of significant investment. And it means confronting an uncertain future that does keep a lot of us awake at night, but for which we have a moral obligation to confront, to act, and to succeed. That's what this program is about, and that's what its successors need to be about. So congratulations to everyone involved in getting us here today. And let's commit ourselves to the next days to being proactive and not being victims. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And I'd like to welcome another member, Representative Ferrante, who is a true champion for her communities on public health, on climate change. And most recently, we've been working on food systems and ensuring the resiliency of our fishermen and women right here on the coast. Representative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, everybody up here said a lot of good things today. And I think the most important takeaway is that there's a lot of people who are dependent on us to get this right. If nothing else, the COVID crisis uh, taught us how vulnerable we are. And as Senator Tarr said, climate change can't be a buzzword. It has to be an action item. And <clears throat> what's so, uh, what gives me so much optimism looking at an, unfor uh, an unpredictable uh, future <clears throat> is that we have this team behind us and everybody alluded to the team in front of us as well and I'll do the same. Um, but as the Secretary just said, you know, it doesn't matter what the issue is. The beauty of working with this administration and working with our town officials is as soon as one recognizes that there's a need to fulfill in the district and across the state, the phone gets picked up, the text comes, the mayor, for some reason, her favorite time to text Bruce and I is between 2 and 4 a.m. in the morning. And uh, we're lucky that she feels comfortable enough to text us at that time. I think some of our best thinking and best ideas, for some reason, come around at that hour. But um, it's a pleasure to be up here with this group. It's very rewarding to work with my legislative uh, counterpart, Senator Torr, and to know that we work on issues in the legislature. We help to make twos available, and then Secretary, Lieutenant Governor, Governor Baker are able to utilize those tools to put them to good use and to make sure that good things happen. So I'm going to be brief and just say thank you to the team up here. Uh, it's a daunting task to keep track of each one of these crises as they pop up, but uh, we do our best. We work together on the local level where the rubber meets the road and we make sure that the job gets done. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for coming with the big check. And uh, let's get more work done. Thank you.
Thank you, Representative. Um, this is going to take me a minute, but I am going to read through the awardees because I think it's interesting to see the, the scope and breadth of these applications. So, Especially when you have three or four time zones you got to work You know, with. And, and, <laughs> and the blazing sun is out. So we start with the town of Acton, who's receiving $75,000 for removal designs and permitting at 53 River Street. The town of Ashfield, I actually walked across this, grant, uh, this dam last weekend, 80, 875000 for repairs to the Ashfield Lake Dam. town of Braintree is receiving a million dollars for the removal of the Armstrong Dam. The city of Brockton is receiving $82,000 for repair, designs, and permitting of the Ellis Brett Pond Dam. Chicopee is receiving $126,000 for repairs to the Plainfield Street Flood Control System. Draycott, $250,000 for the removal designs of three dams. Town of Dudley is receiving $71,903 for removal designs and permitting of the Carpenter Pond Dam. Essex is receiving $1.7 million for repairs to the Conomo Point Seawall. I see some of you here today. Congratulations. Uh, the City of Gardner and our Mayor is receiving $124,000 for repair designs and permitting of the Wayside Dam. Gloucester, you know, $2.3 million for flood mitigation barrier at the high school and another $63,000 for permitting and a million dollars for dam repairs to the Haskell Pond Dam. Hull is receiving $101,000 um, and another $180,000 for repair designs and permitting. Ipswich, $75,000. I believe Ipswich may be here as well. City of Leominster, $163,000. Marshfield, $412,000. Uh, and another $2.3 million for the Brant Rock Seawall. The City of New Bedford is receiving $54,000. Northboro is receiving $168,000. The Town of, Orf of Oxford is receiving $55,000. The City of Peabody, $84,000. City of Quincy, $2.9 million for improvements to the Manette Avenue and Babcock Street Seawall. Salem, is receiving $952,000 for repairs to the Columbus Avenue seawall. Saugus, $261,000 for repairs to the Spring Pond Dam. Somerset, another $250,000 for repair designs and permitting. Springfield, uh, $250,000 for repair and designs and permitting of the Upper Van Horn Dam. Stowe, $44,000. Wareham, $175,000. Weymouth, $102,000. The Wildlands Trust Incorporated, $729,000 for the removal of the Sylvia Place Pond Dam in the town of Kingston. And finally, the city of Worcester is receiving $147,000 for repair designs and permitting of the Patch Pond Dam. And I would just close with, this represents a fraction of the work that we need to do on dams and seawalls. 200 high hazard dams across the Commonwealth, 2,000 dams overall. Un untold numbers of coastal structures that need upgrading. So getting more money and more investment into these programs is a real priority. Thank you to all of the partners who have worked on these grant applications who are here today. And that concludes our program. Questions? Well, we just got it and we're reviewing it and we'll have more to say about it later. Are you considering bringing back a mask mandate in Massachusetts? Is that on the table? We just got the guidance. We're taking a look at it and we'll get back to you on it later. Well, remember, the federal government makes decisions and issues guidance for the country, right? Um, Massachusetts is in a very different place than the rest of the country. We have the second lowest hospitalization rate for COVID in the United States. We've had the second lowest hospitalization rate for weeks. Um, we have the second highest vaccination rate. We actually are behind Vermont in both of those cases. We're certainly number one in terms of both our hospitalization rate and our vaccination rate. Uh, among the big states, and uh, and those things factor into how we make these decisions, and they should, because the vaccines work. What would be your message to folks who are hearing this message from the federal government? Other governors in northeastern states are coming out and already discussing what their positions are. What would be your message to those residents who are hearing this message and to potential visiting the state capitol? 
Well, first of all, Massachusetts, as I said, has the lowest hospitalization rate for COVID of any big state in the country. The only one that's got a lower rate is Vermont. We have one of the lowest spreads of any state in the country if you measure cases per 100,000 population. And we have the second highest vaccination rate in the country when it comes to COVID vaccinations. Um, Massachusetts is in a much better position than the vast majority of the states in this country with respect to how we deal with and how we're prepared to deal with COVID. That would be my message to almost anybody, including people traveling here. So, so Governor, Governor, considering now, those numbers you just, just uh, told us, it sounds like you're not inclined to impose or reimpose the mask mandate. We're looking at the CD guidance, CDC guidance. We're talking to, we have a lot of experts in this community. They have many different opinions on this stuff. And uh, we're talking to many of them and we'll be back to folks shortly. Look, I don't think anybody should make a decision based on any guidance of any kind without first processing it a bit and figuring out what makes the most sense for our particular state. Governor, this is a heightened tour season in Massachusetts right now. We saw what happened in Provincetown. Are you considering maybe reinstituting any travel restrictions? People coming from those states I'm not considering instituting any travel restrictions. Governor, 200 of those experts you mentioned signed a letter saying you need to mandate masks for schools, especially under 12 until a vaccine is available. Your stance on that still considering? Considering. Are you, Last worried, question. That may, are you worried that it may get to that point where you have to start reinstituting restrictions? I think the most important thing we should all do is read the CDC guidance look for them to provide us with information and data that supports the recommendations. Discuss what it means to be a state like this one versus some of the other states that they have to worry about. They have 50 states they need to consider when they make these decisions. Talk to some of the experts in our community. And I would argue that there are many different opinions in Massachusetts among the experts about what the right things to do with respect to this issue are. And I would say that from the beginning, there have been a multiple collection of opinions on practically everything associated with COVID among the experts. People tend to find the expert they agree with, and that's the one they listen to, or the group of experts they agree with, and that's the one they listen to. I like to listen to all of them. And many of them, in many cases, have not just slightly different points of view, but contrary points of view. It depends, to some extent, on what you consider to be the most important measure. And it also depends a little bit on how good you think your data is and what kinds of messages you're getting from other <laughs> people you're talking to about some of this stuff. We'll have something to say, but we're going to process this. This is a big decision. Governor, you're going to sign this up budget, and do uh, you have any concerns about the voting language? Uh, that's a good question. Um, are we dealing with that tomorrow? No, we're talking about it tonight. We have a, we have a meeting today. Yeah, we're talking about it tonight. Do you have any, any concerns about the, the, the voting language? <laughs> I have not talked to the folks on our legal team about it, um, but we obviously know we need to make a decision soon. We're talking to them about it tonight. Are you Thanks, everybody. Starting to behave differently with the rise of, of Delta? No. Mm. Thanks, guys. Governor, different topic. There's a bill before the legislature that would allow first responders to get death benefits if they die from COVID. Is that something that you would be interested in seeing passed? Is that something that you would be interested in seeing passed? Yes. Thank you. 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 Take positions on legislation that's pending unless it's ours. And the part of the reason for that is sometimes it tends to change as it works its way through the process. Um, that's not a bill I'm familiar with. Has it had a hearing? I don't know. Okay. Governor, have you spoken with the Vaxmillions winner? No. <laughs> um, it's not me. <laughs> Is he by number? I thought it was me. Oh, that's right. It was I don't think elected officials are allowed to win. It doesn't matter. They? I already got um, it. I'm about the dam. <laughs> but we, we're planning to uh, to make that announcement tomorrow. Thanks, guys. One, quick, one last question. Just with the rise in the cases of COVID, what are your thoughts and your plans about keeping students and staff safe this year to go to school? That's exactly what we're going to review with respect to the CDC guidance. And the one thing I would say about cases, and this is not just true here, it's true in other parts of the world as well. The more, more vaccines you have, the higher your vaccinated population is, the less likely you are to see significant increases in your hospitalization rates when you have increases in cases. And that's certainly true here in Massachusetts as well. And like I said, we'll have more to say on this shortly. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. For our principals, we're going to do one.